Hello and welcome to Build Back Better, a series of online conversations hosted by For The Region, bringing together businesses, individuals and organisations around a shared vision about what can we done to build back better after COVID and into the future. We're really excited today to be talking about food, <laughs> uh, in particular community growing and local food production. And we're delighted to welcome some experts. And um, I'd like to introduce you to Neil Barry from Clidach Community Green Spaces, Tom O'Kane from Kaitan CSA, Maggie Butcher from Forest Garden Project, Gareth Davis from Pembrokeshire Community Food Network, and Whit Jaisal from Swansea Community Growing. I'm Zoe Antrobus, and this is my colleague and host, Dawn Lyle. Thank you, Zoe. Also to mention, we've got Jessie Kidd um, here as well, also from Kaitan. Thank you all so much for coming along today. And as Zoe says, it's such an important time to start thinking about locally sourced food, community food growing projects. And we're really excited to try and uncover some of the opportunities and the challenges and the obstacles in this sector for the period of time post lockdown as we all come out into a new normal, how can we encourage and enable more locally grown food? So I'd like to start the conversation this morning by inviting each of you to introduce yourselves. I'll start with you, Neil Barry from Clibbet Community Green Spaces. What are you up to and tell us about your work? Hello everybody, just to clarify, it's Swansea Community Green Spaces and Clidock Community Garden is one of the projects that I've been working with on, on that. So, so the Community Green Spaces covers the city and county of Swansea and it involves with working with lots of local communities to make more use of publicly owned green space. Many of the projects are for food growing. Some people are using it for recreation, for environmental improvement, or just to bring the communities together and to reduce antisocial behaviour. Clidock is one of the more exciting ones recently in that I've been working with them for about a year quite closely. It's a brand new project and it partly came out of uh, support from the Growing the Future project at the National Botanic Garden of Wales as well, which is keen to set up community hubs throughout Wales to encourage people to get back into gardening of all sorts, uh, food growing being a very important part of that. And the objectives really for that are the well-being benefits as much as the food growing itself of bringing communities together, helping people with isolation, anxiety issues and other health issues as well. So it's, um, it's really an, a, an exciting one. So at Clidock, it was a piece of waste ground adjacent to the GP surgery. And we have a lot of support also from the local community council and it really took off and you know we we started off say with a piece of waste ground the growing the future project paid for a new polytunnel uh we've cleared the site we put in lots of raised beds over the last year and prior to lockdown we were there every wednesday and we would be getting typically 15 to 20 people from the community and one or two saturdays a month as well and said the the you know it really became a focus for a lot of the people you know that were there maybe for whatever reason it gave them a, a you know something to do every week you know it was a set thing in the calendar and I think that's a key thing with community groups if you can to have a set day every week because lots of groups and, and I can understand but sometimes they'll say it'll be as and when or it'll be on the second Tuesday of the month and then people are scratching their heads is this the second Tuesday and and things like that whereas if you have it at a set time every week, people have it in their calendars, you know, they, they will put it in there and they will come. Uh, so that was that. Some of the other projects we've worked with, uh, sort of said in, it's about bringing the communities together. We've had um, sort of, um, there's one called Sea View Green Space in Mount Pleasant and also Mayhill Washing Lake, two of those. Uh, one is like more like a traditional allotment. The other one is in a public park and they put the food they grow the food out there. It's totally open. People can wander by and help themselves to take things if they want to. You know, my concern with that one was that it might get trashed and so on, but they've had surprisingly little issues actually with any problems there. It seems to have had lots of support from the, the local community on there. So a big thing is, is bringing the community together and um, improving the, the well-being of individuals. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's interesting, isn't it? I think the key message around community cohesion and well-being as much as around the food itself is so important. Tom, I know you're joining us from 
somewhere in a field on Gower from Kaitan CSA. Can you tell us a little bit about Kaitan and uh, your work and your passion for growing food in the local area? So Kaitan is now in its sixth year of production, seventh year since we actually established as an organisation. And my background was really in horticulture, horticultural therapy, and then sort of moving on to working with young offenders. And I kind of, I, what I found was I was really drawn by the production. And actually I found it quite a, there was always that step between engaging people and giving people like really meaningful work in what they were doing in horticulture and actually producing a lot of crops. And then I basically read about and came across community supported agriculture. And for me, that was like, that felt like it was the gap between the two where you could scale up and you could have a commercially scaled project that would pay growers, but you still had all the opportunities or in a sense, even more opportunities to engage people Jesse, you've been involved with Kaitan for quite a while and uh, we love the sound of your project working with children in schools. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I've been involved as a volunteer and a member of Kaitan for a number of years, but I was very fortunate to be able to be offered the position as education officer last year. So I've only done one year of this sustainable schools project. Unfortunately, obviously this year I've been furlough to just we were beginning and I was so excited to start my second year as often second years go isn't it you're ready to change everything and make it all amazing and fantastic and it's all on hold but uh, we're a funded position and all that uh, funding has been ring fenced for me just to start again maybe next March so I run a sustainable schools program so what that means is that the funding that we've raised enables me to go into five different schools this year we've increased our five classes to six classes they're all primary school children aged between six to eleven and what we do we work with them throughout the year teaching them lots and lots and lots of different things so we run something called the pizza project so we teach them how to grow wheat and tomatoes and herbs and we work with pop Tea pizza who comes in and we make pizzas for the whole school so obviously the emphasis is on health and nutrition then we go and visit the gower heritage center where we learn how to bake bread they come and visit the farm so for these children so there's about 150 in total some of these children have never been to the Gower. Lots of these schools are within 10 miles of the Gower. So it's quite an experience for them. It's a really immersive sensory experience for them. It's, it's very holistic. And I suppose the project, there's, there's a couple of aims to the project. And one of the main aims is to really inspire children to become the growers of the future, really. And just to put it out there that there are economic opportunities for them in this environment, you know, so we quite often say to them who likes working outdoors and they're like me, 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 who likes eating food like me, me, me. I said, well, you could do this. And they're like, really? Mm -hmm. And so when they come to the farm we often try and introduce them to as many people as possible because obviously they have a lot of contact with me, which is great, but I'm just one small facet of the whole growing experience so we introduce them to all the volunteers introduce them to we've had people from the university doing research we introduce them to the trainees we just absolutely everybody so they can see that there's value in many many different roles and this comes from every teacher member of staff is that they see these children in a slightly different light because I can come in and my background is in teaching and my background is in environmental science but I left the teaching profession because I felt very constrained and this gives us a different avenue of teaching more hands-on more real life which I'm sure everybody here is is part of that and the anecdotal evidence that we receive from these children who uh, some of the teachers say they only eat chicken nuggets literally they only eat chips and they are picking things from the farm they're eating raw beetroot they're eating raw onion they're eating peas because they can see it and feel it and smell it and touch it you know the a lot of these children have quite difficult childhoods and risk is a big thing for them so coming to this real safe place they feel and taking risks does an inordinate amount for their self-esteem and how they feel about themselves. We hadn't quite realised the impact of the project until we'd finished it. Yeah, I mean, it makes a lot of sense to me. I've got young children, as you know, Jesse, and we've been trying to grow some tomatoes and lettuce during lockdown ourselves. And they're really excited by it. And it mm -hmm. is 
you know, going to make such a difference, I hope, they will eat things that they wouldn't normally eat and uh, just feel more yeah. connected to their food, which is so important. And as you said, they're the growers of the future. Um, yeah. I'm going to, thanks, Jesse. I'm going to come on to Maggie Vicuña. Um, you've started a really exciting project called the Forest Garden Project. Tell us about that. What's forest gardening? I can talk about my project for about three seconds at the moment because it's in its very early stages. So I thought I might talk a bit about how I've come to this place. I started off years ago very unsuccessfully and my father had a um, Mr. McGregor's Beatrix Potter garden with everything in rows and everything wonderful. And I completely rebelled against it and decided I wanted a wild garden, which I achieved. It wasn't quite full of meadow flowers and beauty. It was full of brambles and docks. I've started gradually working out how nature and I can coexist in a mutually beneficial way. <laughs> and I found a bit of wasteland nearby and I went trying to find out who owned it and couldn't. Eventually I asked all the neighbours if they'd like to join me in a, in a community garden. My neighbours and I had a go and it turned out fairly quickly that my idea of <clears throat> polyculture and forest gardening, we didn't quite see eye to eye on it. So I bought a piece of land of my own and I now have a three year old forest garden. In Swansea, the Quakers I belonged to, Swansea Quakers at the time, they had a big problem with people abusing drugs and alcohol and sleeping in the garden which was unfenced. And they went to Wren to try and get a grant to put railings around it. And they said, yes, you, you know, you're in with a chance if you have a community project. So, <laughs> Yeah, my, my moment has come. <laughs> I did that part of the grant and we got, we got the railings, we got the community garden. I met Witch Hazel. Uh, <laughs> it was really helpful. Um, I met lots of community groups. We had meetings and this, the, the community garden is now up and running. My village is in the, up in Cumshin Beth in the, by the Black Mountain. The best business is the food bank. And people still have decking and astroturf, those who are lucky enough to have gardens. And I'm thinking, this, they don't know how to do it. I find it really sad. I'd like to see every community having, this is slightly big thinking, yeah? yeah. <laughs> having access to some land where they could have forest garden, growing polycultures rather than monocultures, just regenerate the land and regenerate themselves. People are not doing very well. We've lost a lot of independence in, in consumerism. We've lost skills. We don't know how to grow things. A community garden, especially one that tried to replicate nature with trees and, and shrubs. It, it helps nature, it establishes habitats and brings in creatures which people can get to understand and respect. But it also gives self-respect and well-being and helps with mental health problems. It teaches skills, cooking, all the things that we've lost. My project, so far, I've got 10 people interested. We're going to have our first meeting. The beginning of it is going to be research and I'm probably going to be knocking on Neil's door and maybe <laughs> a few mm. others. And, yeah. and by time, because I think we really all need to work together. This isn't a competition. Regeneration has got to be cooperative. And I'm really excited about it. I'm excited about meeting people and and exchanging ideas and i think there are a lot of open spaces that are underutilized at the moment and some of them you know maybe a corner of a school playing field but i really think that the community gardens they need structure they need a democratic set set up it's it's learning at many levels and 
I think it's a very exciting um, time that we're in. Scary, but exciting. Yeah. Well, I think you raise a lot of interesting points there about skills, about how communities have perhaps lost those skills and don't realise how easy it could be to grow more of their own food. And your vision of every community having access to growing space and having access to land, um, so important. Um, and I think we'll unpack some of that as we go through today's conversation. Um, Gareth Davies, you're involved with the Pembrokeshire Community Food Network. Is that a vision you share as well, um, every community having access to growing space? And, and how does your network operate in Pembrokeshire? The Pembrokeshire Community Food Network started as a response to COVID-19, just looking at what happens if uh, the UK has issues with their food supply chains should Europe find themselves in an economic situation that the food they produce cannot make it to Britain, what happens then? So myself and County Councillor Chris Thomas had a discussion and we thought now is maybe the time to look at getting a community supported agricultural scheme set up to support every community in Pembrokeshire as a start so that there is local access to locally grown food. But what has emerged from that is the Pembrokeshire Community Food Network and instead of being focused mainly on one model, which is community supported agricultural scheme, uh, it was determined that each community wanted to tackle food security or food sovereignty in their own way, in a way that fit their community better. So that could be a community forest garden, it could be a community supported agriculture scheme, it could be a cooperative, it could take on any form of community project or producer that's already doing something and trying to diversify but we needed a network to support those groups and the network at the moment is a couple of board members we have a constitution underway and we have decided to look at supporting communities and producers as well as individuals who wanted to start up a group. In doing that, eventually we're hoping to be able to provide some funding to ideas that are looking at community growing or supplying food from a local supply chain and uh, any project around that, but always keeping in mind soil health, environmental conditions to support the Future Generations Act but also the three pillars of sustainability. So is it economically sustainable? Is it environmentally sustainable? And is it socially sustainable? So involving people with various backgrounds in that as well, so that everybody is involved. So far, we have four community uh, groups throughout Pembrokeshire covering different regions that have emerged. They are affiliated groups and they started at the same time. So we have the Peninsula Producers in St. David's, we have We Grow Pems in Pembroke area, and then there is Fishguard and Goodick Growing Local, and uh, Brifdir Maur in Newport, Pembrokeshire. And then there is also a producer that is a CSA in Aberaidi area. At the moment, what we are working on is a project with the um, Pembrokeshire County Council, uh, that we're hoping to get off the ground, still in early stages of discussion, but looking at that piece of how do we make food that is grown local as convenient and easily accessible as food from the supermarket. We're a online digital directory or platform that connects locally produced food directly to uh, individuals who want to purchase direct from the producer. One of the issues we're looking at is connecting people who would like to enter the food industry, startups with land. And so that can take on a number of forms. So uh, in order to do that, we're partnering with groups that already do things well. So our, we have an upcoming webinar on what Wales is already doing to combat this issue and what farmers are already doing so that we're not recreating the wheel, we're, we're identifying niches, any sorts of gaps that local groups or producers 
can take on. I think one of the important pieces is also making sure that our farmers markets get to support they need to keep running and providing that space for the producers to be able to supply. I mean, it sounds like a lot of the work you're doing is is really concerned with helping to create the structures, the networks. And I think it's been mentioned already, the importance of those kind of democratic processes and, you know, and enabling projects to happen and, and be successful and joining up what everybody's doing. And we heard from Ben Reynolds in Swansea, who's doing a lot of work with connecting up local food growers. And much as you say, that sort of website portal, he's launched a website called South Wales Food and Drink. And exactly the same goals, really, trying to make it easy for ordinary consumers to choose to buy local, make it as easy as going to the supermarket. And that's a tall ask, but that's the mission. Thanks, Gareth. Witch Hazel, you're from Swansea Community Growing. What's your passion and purpose? And tell us about your work and your project. The Swansea Community Growing Network, we have a committee and we support community growing across Swansea. So we have a wide membership of different types of community growing, such as people in parks, allotment groups, schools, a couple of CSAs, <laughs> including Tom. And we also have members like Swansea Community Farm, Veg Veg, and sort of more high profile organisations as well. Before COVID, we were running occasional events and training. So we try every year to have a whole day event with workshops and speakers and bringing people together. We've been running cafe nights um, to bring people together with local food and we've also run training events. This has had to pause during Covid so that instead we've been uh, supporting members by making sure people understand what the guidelines are and keeping people informed about what to do and how to support them to keep growing during the lockdown on our Facebook group and our Facebook page. One of our aims is to support local food resilience and to work on that issue as well so we're taking steps to try and bring in or think about a local food plan for Swansea it's in very early stages but that it's, a, it's something that's massively missing from such a large diverse city we don't have a food plan we're going to run a couple of zoom events instead of outdoor events so our next cafe will be people bringing a cuppa zoom event networking that way and also a training event I, I also work as a project mentor. I was working with Social Farms and Gardens on the Tabby project. And I've also been delivering locally for a local shop, delivering food. So that's been an interesting sort of experience, seeing how that has been during COVID and also seeing that people are needing it less at the moment. So there's been like a, there's an increase in people needing deliveries and then people getting more confident to go back out shopping again. Thanks, Witch Hazel. We'll move on to sort of an open discussion now. The effect of lockdown, particularly initially, was quite a disruption, wasn't it, to our shopping habits across the region. And I know a lot of people were thinking for the first time, perhaps, about where their food came from. And suddenly, the insecurity of our current global food supply chain was exposed and revealed. And we realised the extent to which we depend on food being transported huge distances to supermarkets in our region. What do you think have been the effects of COVID and the lockdown on people's mindsets about food, both positively and negatively? And do you think there's any prospect of holding on to some of that raised awareness and making food security and food community resilience a key talking point and a key priority for our region? I suppose what I want to say is that I've just, although I've been furloughed, so I've not been on the field, I know that, I don't know, if, I know Tom's weeding currently, but I know he's listening in. I know that we've had a huge increase in people wanting to join the Kaitan. We've got a huge waiting list as it is. Kaitan hasn't really been impacted. It's a highly resilient system. I would second what Jess was saying. Um, for us, it's been like our waiting list has gone up. We have about five or six boxes not collected that are donated to Matt's Cafe. And then since the beginning of lockdown, the, you know, there hasn't been a single scrap left until the last few weeks, actually. It's people's relationship to their food became much more important. I think people just really, just really valued what they can get locally. And I'd say alongside that, it's, you know, it's been good timing with Abby's CSA being launched in Clangeneth. And there's other, you know, there's other projects. We're currently researching a CSA for Morriston or Clace area. And there's another guy in Dunvant who's just sort of coming to talk about establishing a CSA tomorrow. So it feels like the whole climate has been 
very positive in terms of small scale local producing. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Massive uh, increase in awareness and demand. Just for listeners that aren't familiar with the term CSA, can you talk to us a bit about that model? Because as you've said, it's an economically viable model and way of getting food to people. What, what does CSA stand for? CSA is Community Supported Agriculture. And the basic idea of Community Supported Agriculture is that the risks and rewards of farming are shared. So the producer and the consumer both invest physically or financially in the production of food. And then whatever comes out of that production, whether it's good or bad each year, is split amongst the members. Yeah, and it sounds like it sounds like community supported agriculture is really gaining in popularity and, and now is a great time to be talking about and launching more CSA schemes right across the region. What are the challenges? How can we make locally produced food more accessible to more people? And I'm thinking about rural areas as much as urban areas. How can we scale and grow the accessibility of local food? I know that um, I live in a fairly rural area in Gower and our local shop you know, had very, very little by way of fresh fruits and vegetables prior to lockdown because there wasn't the demand. But suddenly when lockdown came, even those people who could go to the big supermarkets and so on, you know, started asking the shop, well, I'd rather not go into the big supermarkets. So they started increasing their supply of fruit and veg. And, you know, they've said that the demand has just been absolutely amazing. So, you know, suddenly within a few weeks of, you know, having a few shriveled up potatoes and a couple of sad looking leeks out of there, they've got a really good display there and it's all locally produced as well so you know and people are now supporting it the message did go out to the community yeah we will have these and we will supply it but you have to come and get it as well so i think you know getting the message across that these things can be changed and they are available there and so far the demand is is continuing so as time goes on people revert back to their old ways is, will be interesting but i think if they can provide at a, a fairly competitive price okay they may not be quite as cheap as the, the big chains but then you're supporting something local the quality is going to be better so it's um, it's how we encourage people to continue with this new way of living and that's that's the big question how do we encourage that to continue which hazel would you like to come in yeah, so I, I agree that um, I think local shops have been amazing and they're very adaptable and flexible, I think. So they've been able to sort of work out how to, how best to support the local community. That's what I've seen around Swansea. Because we're rural, um, it's, it's 10 miles to supermarket, so people therefore have been staying local and shopping locally and feel safer. But I'm wondering now whether that there will be a decline in that support. People won't realise that just them sort of stopping their veg box or just them stopping their order from the local shop won't make any difference. But I think if all of them do it, suddenly the local shops um, don't have that support again. So maybe there's a way of creating something that is more like community-supported agriculture for local, local people. So um, our local bakery, for example, you had to buy, you had to order online a few days in advance for your sourdough bread twice a week and then you could go and pick it up which worked really well and they've just stopped doing that and kind of opened up but I'm worried that even I noticed that because I haven't pre-ordered it maybe I don't quite get down there to pick it up now as much as often so you know how do we ensure that um, we, we keep the customers and you know keep people's regular custom and I think um, there, there must be ways to do that and I think other other ways to do it might be like um, we've got a we've got a farm co in Swansea, so that's online shopping for lo of local produce, and maybe we need some kind of venue, a hub venue as well, where which uh, in Aberystwyth that's what how they work. They have a, a central hub where people can go for local supplies and different different products, and it's a sort of a hub for different activities all around local food. And I think you know we haven't really got that in Swansea exactly, so. That possibility. I think, as you've said, there's this great opportunity to create local hubs that make it easy for people to access locally produced food on their doorstep and looking for ways that we can bring food producers together much more to collaborate in terms of deliveries or collection points. I think there's a key opportunity there. Yeah, I think um, that is one of the things that's come up as central from our discussions as well, is that... Um, Although the farmer's market is wonderful, it's open one day a week, 
and it's not as convenient. So having a shop that goes alongside the, the farmer's market that is open seven days a week or something similar to make it convenient to make those purchases, that is a cooperative of all those attendees from, from the market would be useful. One other thing that uh, did happen in Pembrokeshire, I'm not sure I'll represent it correctly, but somebody from Pembrokeshire County Council recognised a shortage of a supply of flour in shops and was able to get local flour into the public realm in a short period of time. So that was a success. So encouraging the um, supermarkets to look at uh, local products can be successful as well. Having a representative from our county councils that is looking at uh, local distribution is something that pushing for could be uh, beneficial. I heard a story as well about a woman who sells locally produced bread and she'd been really struggling to get any of the local supermarkets to take her bread until lockdown when suddenly they all changed their tune completely and wanted to buy bread from her locally whereas previously they'd been locked into arrangements with their suppliers and weren't able to have that flexibility. So in many ways lockdown has shown us how much of this is possible and how much it is within reach and how flexibly and um, how resilient our local supply chains can be. So I think that's important lessons for all of us. I was actually just reflecting on um, a few different things. And one situation that we've sort of had challenging during COVID was we've got Francesca who grows salads. She's kind of, she's part of Kaitan, but she set up her own business within Kaitan. And all of her outlets were cafes and restaurants pretty much and a few shops. And obviously they, they all dried up and um, she, she's found it very difficult to find other outlets, other reliable outlets. You know, it's kind of easy to find small shops that will take a few bags, but the financial viability of her delivering odd bags here, there and everywhere to people. Do you know, so those networks, I would say, are really essential, um, like Farm Co and places where, you know, people who are producing on a smaller scale can sell fairly big orders and, and get them all delivered in one go to make it financially viable. A chiropractor in Nesta has started selling health foods and they put a big fridge in and they're selling bags of vegetables and salads and things. And I said, would they like some of mine? And they said, yes, there is an opportunity for local people who've got some surplus to to bring it in. Yeah, I was just going to second what Maggie said. I, our local uh, zero waste shop, I'd spoken to someone that runs that uh, pobble down in Pennard. And uh, I'd been to a shop in Narbeth that did exactly what Maggie described. They open up their vegetable area to people that have got that surplus veg to be able to either sell or give it away to customers that come in. It's a really good opportunity because I think lots of us, like Dawn mentioned, her and her kids have started growing tomatoes and things. and there's so many different people have done the same. You couldn't buy compost for a while because it was, there was such a demand. And um, that's a really good idea, Maggie, I think. I think it's a real good opportunity for local shops as well. And um, Jesse, would you like to come in on something there? I've seen a huge resurgence in people growing their own food. You know, lockdown came at the perfect time in the growing season. And I include myself in this because obviously I've been furloughed. I've had itchy, very itchy fingers. And so I've grown an enormous amount of things in my tiny, tiny little garden. And I've just joined this project, which I know that you would have heard of, Dawn, which is called Room to Grow. So the Room to Grow project is being run by a lady who owns Huga, and she has set up a crowdfunding page to raise money to transform the front gardens of Uplands and Bryn Mill into community food grown spaces. My front garden, which is probably, what, two metres by three metres, goes straight onto the road. So I've got two raised beds in there. I currently grow an enormous amount of beans, and they're on the front garden, and so I'm going to be a a sort, of a sort of a pilot project for this scheme for people to come and see what you actually can do but as with lots of growing if you just start off right it just blossoms doesn't it and I've just got an enormous amount of Monge twos now very soon I'll have runner beans just falling onto the road I know a lot of people now a lot of families who have really got into growing and with a little bit of support it could be a huge opportunity just to show how you can be food resilient, you know? Like, it, 
to feed to feed your family with vegetables things you don't actually need that much every day it's it's just you know like i'm already harvesting too much already and having to say as you say give it away or give it to neighbors oh it just ticks all the boxes it really ticks all the boxes with such a really small space i think i think the key thing you've said there jesse is is support my in my experience you know i don't feel like i'm particularly green fingered i've been really keen to start growing a bit of veg at home we've got decking we haven't got any grass so we've made raised planters but I just feel out of my depth in terms of the skills. What I love about the Room to Grow project, which seeks to just turn ordinary gardens, and many of the properties in our area are HMO rental properties, so nobody takes care of any of those gardens. And the brilliant thing about the Room to Grow idea is that a team of growers would effectively manage that that growing space but in doing so would teach the householder yeah. how to do it and the householder would be really connected to that process and could be involved or not involved that would be up to them but I would love that. It's a real shared experience um, I've managed to convince two of my neighbours to be part of this project and they've just got concrete outside the front. They're both working doctors. One of them's just had a baby. They're incredibly busy people. And so they look at my garden and go, oh, I would love to do that. And I'm like, it doesn't take much. But actually, if you haven't got the skills, it does. It, it's, it's very overwhelming. It's really overwhelming. You know, I take a lot of this for granted just because it's what I do. But as I say, like the raised beds are going in now, the compost will be going in, people will be helping to water. And as you gain in those skills, it just doesn't become a chore. It becomes a real pleasure. And actually using your time to water is not, oh, I need to water the garden. It's actually something that I would choose to do to bring my health and well-being fill my pot or so um so yeah. i just i think sort of you know when we look at community spaces they don't have to be a central large two acre space it can just be little pots that are all interconnected talk to us a bit about what you think about skills and as jesse says alternative models of encouraging and supporting communities to grow food yeah, my, um, my background was as a lecturer in horticulture, so I taught for a number of years and I still do some work both with the Growing the Future project, running a variety of courses, and some of those are on, on food growing. Last year, when we started up the Clitter Community Garden, when we had an excess of produce, we were donating it to the local food bank. This is pre-COVID. Uh, but one of the feedbacks that we were getting regularly from them was that the people just didn't know what to do with the fresh food that we were donating. And, you know, there's definitely an opportunity like what Jesse is doing with the cooking, obviously with the schools and so on. But I think, again, we have that mixed generation. There's a lot of people haven't quite sure what to do with this fresh food and how to cook it and to create useful meals from it. Kite Town were fortunate to receive a grant from the council, which was a food poverty grant. So alongside the project that I run with schools, I had a second project that I was about to initiate again, which unfortunately didn't start, which would have been incredible if I'd managed to get a month or so into it. I was working with children in place, and then I had invited a small number of parents of those children so that we were going to grow from home. So it was a very similar project to the Room to Grow, actually, which is wonderful to know that these like-minded things are happening. So the plan with this project was that I was going to work with the parents of the children. So I was growing with children in school and improving their knowledge. But actually what you need to do is work with families so to improve their knowledge and we would grow the same things so they could all come together they could work together we'd bring family unity as these things outdoor learning does within that project we were going to create a little network so they could all support each other and then that just ties in so many different things so many you know as i say community cohesion getting to know your neighbors I'm saying to people you know growing your own food is like printing your own money it sounds like there's such a an explosion of interest. I think this was happening even before COVID-19 and lockdown. I think we were all so much more concerned and interested in where our food comes from, but also the well-being and community and social inclusion benefits that come along with, with growing food closer to home and involving more people in that. Gareth, I know in Pembrokeshire, you've got, you know, farming and agriculture is a huge 
part of the Pembrokeshire economy and Puffin Produce, which is I think a cooperative of Pembrokeshire farmers, supply all the vegetables to major supermarkets across the UK. What more do you think can be done to capture more of that food to stay locally or to start to tap into the scale that a company like Puffin Produce has to support smaller agricultural initiatives? My understanding is one of the things prohibiting smaller groups is the cost of infrastructure and machinery. Having access to refrigerators to keep produce fresh or sharing the cost on transporting those goods if they had a shared refrigerator or shared refrigerator van. It's quite trendy at the moment for local farms to share a um, milk pasteuriser and share the cost or the usage of that so that a farmer could go to another farm to pasteurize his milk and then uh, supply that locally or also a um, local could take their glass bottle up to the dispenser and fill up their own glass bottle with fresh milk from the area so these sorts of costs associated with infrastructure or land there are a number of prohibiting factors to local startups for example access to an underutilized farmland so the farming connect group uh, have a venture program that connects farms that maybe they want to wind down now they're at retirement stages but they don't want to lose the farm that they've lived on they don't want to stop it being productive so they are looking for local people who want to start growing or, or learning from them that uh, skills transfer. If we are not producing locally because uh, farmers are getting closer to retirement age and they don't want to stop living where they are, that is another barrier to maintaining growth to begin with. And access to land is an issue. One of the board members for the Pembrokeshire Community Food Network is trying to do a cooperative share scheme on a land purchase. Again, you don't want to step on the toes of local producers already. You want to find a niche or support the local producer to diversify or supply locally to begin with, as well as doing your own community um, initiatives. To sort of wrap up today's conversation, I'm really interested to hear from each of you, perhaps what are the opportunities for us to strengthen this whole sector right across South West Wales? Is it more joined up working? Is it sharing best practice? And is it something around skills, access to land? Local authority support is really important. So the attitudes of planners and the understanding of planners about you know, the importance of food growing land. That's one important obstacle, I think. Um, I think perhaps I was interested by what Gareth said about how Pembrokeshire works regionally because it's quite a big county and Swansea is quite diverse in its different areas. You know, we've got a city and we've got rural areas and we're quite spread out. So I'm thinking a, a regional working might work well for Swansea as well. Um, sort of getting, dividing up a bit and, and working with a, an overall kind of support, but, but in but satellite projects supporting this idea of local growing and local food supply. And I think in Swansea, food growing has proved to be quite strong but local food producers sort of working together I don't know how how well that works overall so I think bringing those two things together and that's where our local food plan I guess would come in bringing the suppliers and producers as well as food growers together um, to sort of market produce and get it out there and also increasing skills as well and perhaps that idea yeah Gareth mentioned of food um, storage perhaps we need to um, find a way to increase and improve that availability for smaller producers. Thank you. Um, Neil, a key challenge and a, and, a, and a key opportunity. What do you think needs to happen? What are the obstacles and, and how can we solve, solve them? Well, I think the, the opportunities is, you know, technology has really come into its own during COVID as well, where people are able to promote their products. I know certainly in Gower, again, the meat producers, a lot of them, because I guess it's a more higher value product, product, but, you know, they're advertising their meat packs and things like that, which, you know, they hadn't been doing prior to that, because, again, their markets of cafes and restaurants and so on had dried up. So, so getting out directly to people 
that way, south of Onda. I think the, the model of the CSAs, like at Kaitan and at Abbey's one, I think that's that's a huge potential of getting people together south of there. And, you know, when I was, I as as Witch Hazel has, we're both uh, members of the, the new one at Big Meadow. And when you go there on a Thursday afternoon to pick up your vegetables, it did cross my mind that actually it would be a perfect opportunity for other producers to also have their goods there at that time, whether it's meat or cheese or, you know, any other products as well. So you're guessing, what is it, 46 people, I think, currently signed up at Big Meadow. So there's, you know, potentially 46 customers turning up there to collect their products, people who are obviously enthusiastic on local produce and supporting the, the producers. So I think, again, more of that networking, um, a bit like what Garrett mentioned as well about you know, people forming networks and so on. But apparently many years ago in Gower, there was quite an active cooperative of fruit producers and they did have a storage unit with cold storage, transportation infrastructure, all together at a single hub. All the producers brought their produce there and then it was transported from there to various customers. Um, so again, you know, it was done in the past for whatever reason it, it didn't, continue but um you know i think definitely the the networking opportunity and availing of of technology i think of the two the two ways forward thank you yeah some really key themes coming through there about um hubs i think that's a great idea about making the community supported agriculture collection hubs um open perhaps to other producers to um in, engage with customers there um Gareth, final comments on challenges and opportunities. What do you think this region needs to do? I, I suppose it's not so much just talking with the communities, but also engaging farmers and changing policy. One of the many things that is sort of emerging in Pembrokeshire is that community assets are being turned over to the communities, such as uh, public toilets, for example. But our green spaces are also beginning to come up for negotiation, potentially. And are we able to use those green spaces and have that discussion with the local authority to um, change them from being just a wildlife or football field to being a multi-purpose zone that could grow food. Uh, we could always reseed it with grass should our initiatives um, fail. Um, another sort of thing that I'd like to challenge is the smaller scale farm being absorbed by the larger scale commercial farm when uh, that farmer is no longer able to farm later on. So um, there are people out there that just don't want to see that happen to their, their um, family farm. And uh, how do we keep it that a um, small holding is maintained as a small holding rather than um, split up? And what sort of policies could we change to keep um, a more sustainable small farm model um, oper operating? So. Um, policy, I think, is a big one, and I know that um, the Land Workers Alliance does a lot to sort of encourage policy change. So, if you don't know about them, I think working with them would be uh, very beneficial to anybody involved as well. Great. Yeah, I think a key point there about succession planning and how we make sure that small farms can be handed on to other people in the community that can keep them going um, when facing retirement and stopping the uh, conglomeration of farms into these massive commercial industrial farms. Thank you. Um, Maggie, final thoughts, uh, what you'd love to see? What, what should we all be doing? We need a lot more lead from government, local and national, to prioritise good agricultural land over building land. No, we, we mustn't build houses over our best agricultural land. And I think that we need to look at farming in a rather different way. And rather than amalgamate small farms, think about breaking up large ones and going more for horticulture and market gardens than big areas of monoculture. 
I don't know how we persuade people to do that, but I think it has to come from government because the, we have to have a different mindset. The last, um, the latest climate change report is dire. We can't carry on using fossil fuels in the same way. We really do need to change our thinking on it. Um, right, and then I'll just throw in a really, a really crazy one at the end, which is, I heard on the radio somebody talking about bringing in to small villages even a big um, container, shipping container, and growing. Um, with, with um, hydroponics, loads and loads of food for the local community. Now, I don't know how organic this is, and how, I don't really know enough about the technology, but wow, it could possibly do something for, quite easily for local communities. Thanks. <clears throat> yes, finding new ways to make um make it easy for communities to grow their food. I think there are so many great innovative ideas and great examples that we could all follow. And I heard recently of an orchard growing project that's coming to our region as well to encourage us all to grow more fruit trees, which um, I think would be a wonderful initiative. Um, Zoe, I'm going to come to you and see whether you've got any closing thoughts. As it's been discussed, a lot of us have started shopping locally and using businesses that are selling locally grown produce. And I just think we have to keep that going as much as possible. I agree wholeheartedly with everything that's been said. And I think this needs to be approached on a whole load of different levels. I think from the scale of places, um, you know, large cooperatives across Wales down to sort of smaller projects like ours and then right down to people in their back gardens it seems like you know we really need to push on every scale for more growing and I would say particularly because that's my knowledge area is the scale we're working at is that there just really isn't as much as you would like to get local produce into shops it isn't available there aren't the growers are there the land isn't available for those growers and the skills aren't there either. So I would say that, you know, there's a massive need for policy change. Again, I'd highlight the Land Workers Alliance and supporting everything they're doing. Um, and basically pushing our local MPs and local politicians to say, you know, we need access to more land. We need young people to be given the skills to grow. And also, I think essentially, when people are setting up projects, they need like financial support to establish themselves like government grants to get people going and get their projects set up to a point where it can be financially viable. Um, and also the last key thing, which I would say, which I'm sure Jess would say if she's still there, is the whole schools thing. I think, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of the, a sort of backbone of it, that we engage young people in local food and make it real for them so that every child growing up actually sees that growing local food is a viability for them or if not, it's something that is part of their real life and everyday life. So yeah, that's what I'd say, thanks. Brilliant. Jessie? Yes, I think, uh, yeah, so Tom's taken those words straight out of my mouth. So I think one thing we haven't really covered a great deal and is exactly what I do is sort of education from the bottom up. So children are very easily inspired. And when I run these sessions where we, we I run a, 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 a a game where we where it's called miles from home where we look where the food comes from and and track how many miles and etc cetera, etc cetera. children children are appalled they they just don't know these things they're like why would why would we buy butternut squash from from south africa they they ask me all these questions all the time like why they 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 really don't understand uh why we do what we do <laughs> they really don't get it and and so when you know, and these are children from quite deprived areas and they get it very, very quickly. And, and if they have the opportunity to carry on doing the things that we are teaching them to do, they would do it without a shadow of a doubt. So I think education, like especially now with the new curriculum coming in, with our new areas of learning, you know, the core principles become an ethically minded citizens. It ticks all the boxes what we do. And in some of the schools that we're working with, they are redesigning their themes around Kai Tan because it ticks so many boxes and because it delivers exactly what they need. They are beginning to change their lesson plans. Um, 
so I really think education and, and getting in at that level is essential is essential to, to developing skills and sort of igniting just these opportunities. And um, I don't know if Tom is still there, but Tom is currently putting together like a, a, or looking into an all Wales network training scheme for CSAs. Because what, what me and Tom often talk about is that we gather these children and this, this impetus, impetus at a very, uh, uh, you know, it's sort of six, seven, eight, nine, ten, And then we sort of lose them, don't we? We lose children and they're, what they what they really really love especially sort of nature-based learning is completely lost in in secondary school and then they come to thinking about what they want to do with their lives so it just needs a continuum of skills whereas obviously neil um you know really he, you know the skills that he imparts you know if you talk about the skills he imparts to me with sort of older younger adults and then we're missing the very core of what we really need is young people and young people you know we won't we I, I lots of lots of the children now are talking to me about climate change they're talking to me about carbon footprints they know about this stuff they get it and and these are the people that really need our support and their families need our support to be able to make the changes that we want to change so i think you know schools and education and the new curriculum needs to be part of this discussion couldn't agree more with that, Jesse. Thank you. Um, I think changing the mindset starts with, with working with children and then the, finding the opportunities for young people to make a career in food growing, working the land, working in nature, um, and much more joining up around training is so important. There's so much that projects like Kaitan have learned over the last few years, not least about access to land and how the, you make the business work. Um, but also the educational component and how you engage children. Um, and the more we can share best practice across our region and make growing and community growing and local food much more visible, much more part of our everyday lives and a much more viable career option for young people who, as you say, are naturally passionate about, um, about growing and about being outside and uh, so much culture change that needs to happen but it feels like that is starting to shift it would be great if all of you would share with us following this conversation any links and email addresses so that our listeners can get in touch with you about any of the projects and initiatives that you've mentioned today and we'll do our bit to try and keep this conversation connected across southwest wales we're particularly interested in what's happening in Neath the Talbot, Swansea, Carmarthenshire and Pembrokeshire because that's our region but I think across Wales it's a massive priority and uh, we look forward to working with all of you and seeing your projects progress and scale and develop over the next few months and years. Thanks all so much for joining us for this roundtable conversation by For the Region. Zoe and I are delighted to have spoken to you all today. Thanks everyone for listening in and we'll talk to you all again soon. Bye for now.